Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Physician Pathways. Today we have Dr. Greg Huggins. He's an emergency medicine resident here at SLU. We're just going to be asking him a few questions about his journey to emergency medicine and everything in between. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, do you think you could start by just introducing yourself and kind of just giving us an overview of where you're from, where you went to med school, where you are now? And yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, so I am actually originally from St. Louis, uh, one of the few at SLU. Um, I went to undergrad at Rockhurst in Kansas City, um, did the scholars thing and uh, ended up back at SLU here. Um, I think that was like 2017 through uh, basically a year ago, I graduated from med school here at SLU. Um, I matched in emergency medicine here at SLU and uh, that's, yeah, still here. Um, another couple of years left, hopefully make it through them. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Um, so right off the bat, what do you think med students should know about um, the emergency medicine residency? Um, yeah, so generally kind of the, the essence of emergency medicine is to be um, kind of the doctor that the patient needs at any given time. Um, you know, you never know what's going to come through the door um of your er you have to be prepared for anything that comes in um so most of our residency is spent um sort of trying to prepare us for any eventuality um your intern year you rotate on multiple different services you do a trauma service for a month uh, overnight um, you spend a month in the micu um, you spend a month on anesthesia um, in the NICU and the OB ward um, and the pediatric ICU, as, as well as the uh, pediatric ER over at uh, Cardinal Lennon. Um, and then the rest of your residency is basically just in the ER, um, as well with a couple of uh, surgical ICU and NICU months there as well. Um, and yeah, you're kind of the kind of just cementing those skills of, of being ready for anything at any any time. Um, and at SLU, we certainly see pretty much anything any given day. Um, anything can come to the door. Um, so I'd say, yeah, it's it's kind of just being having that diverse skill set and building that diverse skill set is uh, what our residency is about. That's awesome. And so, like, what does I mean? when I, this is gonna, I'm going to set myself up here. It's so like, when do you usually, you know, like go to work, come back home? What does your schedule look like? Or do you just? Yeah. Um, so a, there's some small variations um, based on which program you go to. Um, our program operates off of eight hour shifts. Um, so there's basically three different um, shifts uh, every, each day because we staff the ER 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so there's a morning shift, which is like seven to three, um, an evening shift, like three to 11, and then an overnight shift of 11 to 7 a.m. the next day. Um, and there's some slight variations just based on you know coverage, but um, we generally work 21 shifts a month, um, our first and second year. Um, that's kind of our schedule. Um, other programs do 12 hour shifts and they work I don't know, something like 16 to 14 different shifts a month. Um, oops, sorry. Um, that's just how they tend to do it. Um, for us, this works better. Um, yeah, it's kind of totally dependent on where you go. But that's kind of a general, that, that's how most places end up doing it. But yeah. Okay. So on top of that, do you also have on, an on-call schedule or is that kind of just like you're set with those shifts and that's it? On our emergency medicine months, um, that is just it. Those are our shifts. Um, if you're on one of your, like the PICU months or the SICU months, you might do some on-call shifts like every few days um, where you're in the hospital for 24 hours. Um, you're not necessarily working constantly, but you, you know, um, you're you there, they need you. Um, so most, most of our on-call stuff is through uh, off-service rotations. But uh, generally in emergency medicine, it is shift based. You are either there or you're not. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, it's a very nice style that way. <laughs> um, what are your top three or more given or standard procedures or patients? Um, like what do you most likely see, I guess? 
Um, let's see. So, I mean, the, the essence of uh, emergency medicine is that we see everything. Um, the, from the super easy um, laceration repairs, we do a ton of those. Um, people have little abscesses that we drain um, to the um, crazy procedures. Um, you know, we've done multiple transvenous pacemakers in the department this year for people that have gone into complete heart block. Um, probably one of the more common um, fun procedures, in my opinion, is intubations. Um, we do a lot of those. Um, let's see, we do a lot of procedural sedations for people while ortho or other services are you know, doing procedures on them. Um, we have a wide, a huge wide range of procedures that we do, but probably, um, yeah, I mean, lac repairs, intubations, um, we do chest tubes pretty frequently as well. Um, yeah, we, we do a lot of procedures, but yeah, uh, those are some of the more common ones that you'll see in the ED. That's awesome. Well, so coming to like, how did you know that this specialty was best for you? Were you like picking between specialties and like what kind of, uh, what was your thought process going through that decision? Yeah, um, so I think like my first year of med school, um, I was really focused on a specialty that had a strong emphasis on procedures. Um, I really wanted to be using my hands and doing cool things with them. Um, as I kind of moved into second year, we spent you know a ton of our time studying for step, but I was also doing some research with some of the surgical specialties because that was kind of the it's like oh procedures that's kind of a surgical thing. Um, wasn't super into the whole the research that I was doing, um, but I was like okay I'll just stick with this and see what you know surgery in my third year is like. Um, and I hated it. <laughs> um, I didn't like the OR. I didn't like the lifestyle. I mean they were you know, we were working like 14 hours a day, every day, and the residents were all beat down. And, you know, I don't know, that was, it was just not, not for me at all. Um, and so I met one of the, uh, the interns from the emergency medicine program who was rotating on OB with, with me actually, and the rest of our uh, little med student group. Um, so we kind of just uh, sat around talking to him all day because there was nothing else to be done. Um, you're just waiting for deliveries on the, the rotation. Um, and so he was just telling us all about emergency medicine and what he liked about it and the lifestyle, um, and, you know, this, his day-to-day -day in the ED. Um, and it just sounded, it just sounded really cool to me, um, at that point. And I was kind of just discovering that I really hated surgery at that same time point. <laughs> um, and so that was kind of, and then he basically told me I needed to rotate on the trauma surgery service when I moved to surgery like the next block of surgery or whatever. Um, and so I did that and it was actually with another EM president. Um, and we basically on the trauma service, you spend probably 80% of your time in the ED. So I got a ton of exposure to that environment while I was down there. And we, we in the ED are also a major part of the uh, trauma resuscitations um, responsible for the airway in those. Um, and, and just that whole experience just kind of cemented it from there that I was like, you know, this is, this is for me. Um, this is what I wanted to be doing. And the rest of third year going through all the other rotations, I was kind of like, nah, these, uh, I already know what I want. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, just doing my EM rotations fourth year, pretty much just even, it pretty much just confirmed that I made the right choice. It's nice that you knew so early. I feel like I hear a lot of horror stories like, oh, I was going in the fourth year, getting ready to apply and then I ended up switching and stuff like that. So I feel like at least you had the peace of mind of knowing that that's right for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, I think somewhat uh, you, your guys will have a different experience because with with my class, you know, you could pretty much rule out some things based off of your step score. Like if you didn't get a 270, you probably weren't going to do neurosurgery. You know, if you didn't hit certain numbers, you weren't going to do derm, you weren't going to do ortho. Um, some people, I'm sure, still do those things with lower scores, but you know, at the, you kind of give yourself like, hey, I'm not really that that league. Um, so, I mean, that's we'll see how you guys move forward, considering you don't have that sort of, uh, you know, denominator. Uh, that might be a good thing for you guys. Uh, keeps your mind a little bit more open, but I don't know. It's a little bit different. Um, 
yeah but for me it kind of ruled it kind of narrowed the field down a little bit because i was like ah, i'm not quite you know i'm not quite in one of those leagues so yeah luckily the class above us are going to be the guinea pigs not us so there you go. we'll see how they, we'll see how they do and then figure it out from there yeah we were the guinea pigs for uh virtual interviewing and i can tell you that is terrible and I would never think about it. <laughs> sounds like it yeah. We'll see how it is when we go around in the three years from now. Yeah, hopefully it's gone by then. Fingers crossed. Um, okay, so what do you love most about your job? And then on the flip side, what do you love least about your job? Um, let's see. I mean, I kind of like a little bit of a chaotic environment. Um, not everybody likes that. That's actually one of the things that people hate about the ED. Um, when they rotate down there. Uh, so I kind of like the constant um, task switching. I kind of like, you know, trying to manage, keep chaos under, under control. Um, there's always 10 different things going on downstairs. Um, you never know what's gonna happen. You never know what the actual condition of the patient is that you're dealing with until you've kind of, they've been in the room for a little bit. So kind of anything can happen, um, which for me keeps it from getting boring. Um, there's very little time that you're just sitting there staring at the computer screen, waiting for a new person, a new person to come in or for a page to go out or anything like that. Um, so that's kind of, I, I just kind of like, you never know what's going to happen. That's kind of what I like about it. Um, the, probably the downside is that, um, there's, you know, you, you might, you never know what's going to happen is also the downside probably too. Um, because you will get um, patients that are extremely rude to you. You can get patients that um, sort of all start to crash at the same time if you're not careful. Um, you know, just, just there's a million different things that can go wrong. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's, and you can end up in situations where you don't feel like you're, you're doing your best job ever because just, a, you know, there's too many things happening at once. Um, so personally, if, if I don't feel like I'm taking fantastic care of all of my patients because there's just too much going on, you know, that makes me feel a little bit bad. But um, at the same time, you know, sometimes that just can't be helped. It is. I'm curious, is um, physician burnout something that you're concerned about? And like, do you see that around you? Um, uh, yeah, so so we're kind of the poster child for burnout. Um, You'll see all of the uh, the great, um, like the Dr. Glaucom Flecken uh, videos makes fun of us for that pretty hardcore. Um, and we definitely, you know, there's some people where you can see where it's like, oh, you're definitely a little bit, you know, a little bit burned out. Um, we're a little bit, uh, probably a little bit shielded from it being in an academic environment. Um, you know, we don't have the same kind of, we have, I'm sure our attendings have some quotas, but they don't have nearly the um, sort of quotas for patients uh, seen in a shift that, you know, some of the community doctors have, um, you know, so there's a little bit, there's a little bit of a difference in, in our environment um, that, you know, might chill us a little bit. Um, I don't know, it's, it's kind of, I guess it's, for me, I don't worry about it a ton because, you know, you'd have to have your priorities straight necessarily at this point. And who knows what, you know, in five years, I'll be saying, but at this point, I, I kind of enjoy seeing a lot of patients and um, doing the work um, that might change over time, obviously. So I don't know. It's, uh, but at the moment, I, I'm not super concerned about it. Um, and there's, there's a great amount of flexibility in the amount of uh, work that you can take on as an EM doctor or as an attending. Um, you can sort of decide, hey, I'm only going to work X number of shifts per month on this contract in this place. Um, and so long as there's somebody willing to hire you to do that, you can kind of do that. You're, you're not necessarily, you know, unless you go work for a big group and they stipulate, you know, hey, you have to do 140 hours a month um, and you're going to work these shifts and you have no other options, you know, you that you're not stuck doing that unless that's the only offer you have on the table. So we're kind of the like original, you know, mercenary kind of uh, medical doctors. <laughs> um, we're notorious for taking contracts in random places. And, you know, they go, I, my friend knows somebody who works five shifts a month in like, rural Idaho. 
he makes really good money doing that and then he flies back to California. <laughs> so no, that's cool to know that there is flexibility because I think the the burnout thing is what a lot of people are scared to uh, um, go to emergency medicine for, but that's good to know. But yeah. Um, yeah, so like looking back, is there something that you wish that you would have known or done differently as like a med student? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I I don't have a ton of regrets from med school. Um, I think I probably would have tried a little bit harder to remember all of the like physiology and stuff um, that they teach you those first couple of years. Um, it definitely, like things that you think you'll never use can come back around and, you know, it's like, shoot, I have to relearn this because I totally, like I studied it for the test and that was it. Um, there were definitely things now that I'm like, oh, that's, yeah, I remember that sketchy video for that, but I couldn't tell you the details of it. Um, so I think I would have probably tried a little bit harder to cement those things in my long-term memory instead of just studying for the test. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think I, I, I also probably would have tried to see more patients as a, as a med student. Um, cause really that's a, that's a fantastic learning opportunity that like, you know, now if I have a busy ED, I'm just trying to see everybody kind of make sure that they're alive and keep things moving. Um, but as a med student, you guys kind of have you, well, you will have um, the luxury of like really examining a patient, really talking to a patient, really like getting your physical exam down on them. Um, and, you know, it, it seems like it's not a lot of time, but it really is a lot of time that you have with these patients. Um, and just, you know, the more experience you have of working with them, the better, um, you know. And so I think, I think that was an opportunity that I, I could have taken more advantage of, but I, I mean, overall, I think I did okay. That is horrible news about remembering physiology. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's definitely not everything. I don't think I use endocrine very much aside from the diabetes kind of stuff um, and thyroid. Um, but there's a lot of cardiac stuff that we use constantly. There's, you know, um, you know, just there's, there's many things that it's like, oh, the, it would be really nice to remember the underlying mechanism of that, but you know, not a ton of it actually makes a huge difference, but um, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, I'm curious about that, but also I shouldn't know that. <laughs> no, that makes sense. It makes sense that what they're teaching us, we actually have to know. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I will say there was a lot, I don't, I mean, you guys will have to see, um, again, with step being different, but there was a lot of like random minutia that I feel like we were taught just for that test that was just completely, I mean, why? And, you know, like just why would I, why would I ever memorize this random fact about biochemistry? And, but, you know, that's, we'll see. You guys still have biochem for sure, but I don't know. I feel like there were like whole podcasts that people would like go through and memorize like every cycle that was known to man. It was just- Oh gosh. Yeah, well, I'm not be doing that. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so since you're a first year, you're one year out um, of med school, do you think you could just talk a little bit about the residency application process, or at least as much as you remember from um, that and how that yeah, went? Yeah, um, so kind of as you go into the beginning of your fourth year, end of your third year, um, they'll be giving you a lot more info at that point. Um, but the main kind of things is you'll, you'll start working on, you know, if you need to do an away rotation, you'll have to start applying for those, you know, around that end of third year um, and start getting your letters of recommendation in order. Um, so that's kind of the first kind of starting point, at least for most people. Um, and you get those materials together, you get those rotations planned, you go and you do your sub-I. Um, most, most people at least will do their little like sub-I, sub-internship um, as a beginning of their fourth year. Um, they'll try to get a letter of recommendation from that. Or if you're, um, if you're in EM, we have what's called a slow, which is a like, special letter of evaluation or something. Um, basically it's kind of your letter of rec from 
um, each program that you rotate at. Um, so you'll get one for your home rotation, um, you'll get one for an away rotation if you do an away rotation or two. Um, and it's kind of a standardized letter that each of the programs will do. Um, and they kind of rank you in thirds, like top third, middle third, or bottom third of where they would rank you on their match list. Um, and then they put in, obviously put in comments too about, you know, this, this student was the greatest you know, greatest student doctor I've ever had, you know, whatever, um, or they were terrible, they were racist, they were misogynist, whatever. Um, all of that can get written in that letter. Um, and so you can, it can either make or break you. Um, and I mean, every year we get people where it's like, oh, that, that broke you. Um, <laughs> um, so that's kind of the big thing with, at least with EM. Uh, other, other specialties, it's more of it's just kind of a letter and they just write about it great things that you did while you were on your sub eye or the great research you've done with them over the last two years or um, how amazing you were as a third year med student, whatever, uh, whatever your experience was with them. You get those figured out. Um, you get those submitted, those get submitted actually through ERAS. Um, and so then ERAS is obviously the electronic residency application service or whatever. Um, and you'll put in all of the things you've been doing the last few years, all of your educational details. Um, I think you can even, you can even submit, yeah, you do, you submit cover letters. Um, some people do them for each program. Some people just have a generalized one. Um, and so you put that out there. That's like in September, I believe September, or early October. I can't remember which, and they had moved ours around because of COVID. Um, and so you send that out. And usually sometimes for the end of October, early November, the programs will start sending out um, interview application or interview invites. Um, and they, for us, were all virtual, um, which meant that you could kind of just take as many as you wanted. So some people were holding on to like 40 interviews, which was nuts. Um, hopefully for you guys, when you're, you know, when you're a fourth year, you'll actually get to go to where these are. Um, these interviews and see the program and get a tour and meet everybody in person instead of having little virtual happy hours, which are awkward and you don't really get to know the people. Um, <clears throat> and so those all go out and you'll schedule those. Um, and if they're in person, obviously you'll have to plan around everything, which is I'm sure a nightmare. That was one thing I missed out on. I didn't spend a ton on travel because I didn't have to go anywhere. Um, and so then you're kind of November, December, January, um, you'll, you'll do all those interviews and you'll see all the people you meet, you'll shake all the hands, um, you'll kiss all the babies. Um, and then sometime in February, you're, uh, I think towards the end of February, your rank list will be due. And so you'll make a rank list of all the different, uh, programs that you interviewed at, um, well, hopefully that you interviewed at. It'd be kind of weird if you put one down that you didn't interview at. Um, and so then the, the programs themselves all make a list too. And so there's, there's, it's called the, um, the way this, this works is very famous. It won the Nobel Prize. It's called the stable marriage concept. And so they make a list and you make a list and how those match up is, is how it, people get matched. So if you're both, if you're number one and they're in, in their eyes and they're number one in your eyes matched, um, and you can, there's videos, it's all super complicated and beyond my, my knowing um, how it works past that. But um, that all comes out on match day and there's your match. So it's stressful. It's um, the most alcohol I've probably consumed in my entire life is during those few months. As you should. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Um, and then you end up, um, mm, sorry, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> you finish your fourth year and then you're a doctor yeah and most of the time you want to plan your fourth year so that you are not doing a crazy hard rotation at the end of it is what i will say i had a friend who did um mick you as like may of his fourth year and i was like why that sounds horrible <laughs> yeah hopefully he's not listening <laughs> <laughs> it's 
Yeah. Um, and then, so we talked a lot about <laughs> the residency and the life in medicine. So I wanted to ask like, what does life look like for you outside of medicine um, for the past year at least? Um, yeah, so I have a wife and a, what now, 20 month old daughter. Um, so I spent a lot of time with them. Um, we bought a house. Um, you know, I kind of, I work and then I come home and I see them and, uh, you know, I luckily have a decent amount of, um, uh, kind of non-work time to spend with them. Um, yeah, um, past that, I mean, it's kind of, you obviously have to spend a decent amount of time studying. Um, we still have boards that we have to pass. Um, every week we have conference on, usually on Wednesday mornings, um, where we will get together with the entire program. And, um, you know, we, we get lectures, we do some case-based learning, um, there's presentations, there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, and so that's kind of like a once weekly sort of academic activity. Um, sorry, my voice is going. You're totally good. I actually just have one more question for you. Yeah. We'll let you go to your, to your daughter and wife. Um, but do you have any last pieces of advice for medical students or anyone that might be listening? Um, let's see. Um, you know, people will keep telling you this um, throughout the next three years, especially during your third year, uh, but you're, you're paying for this education. So make sure you're actually like getting your money's worth. Um, so, you know, if, if uh, you're on a rotation and there's something you don't really want to do, but it seems like maybe it'd be a good educational experience, do it. Um, you'll see a lot of your classmates will, will kind of be that guy that like, doesn't really show up because they know nobody's going to notice. Sometimes people are noticing and you don't realize it. Um, and those people are also, they're paying, what, 58000 or whatever a year to do to, you know, not come in and not learn things. So um, I, having the debt now, it's like, ooh, I'm really glad I showed up most days because <laughs> I got my money's worth, I'd say. It's a good way to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, past that, I mean, obviously, um, choose a specialty based on what, um, you know, take, take lifestyle into account. I mean, you're going to meet people where if you go into some of these specialties, it is your life. You are not, you, you spend 80% of your time in the hospital doing that thing. Um, because that's what it takes to succeed in that specialty. So, you know, if, if that's what you want, great. Um, like ortho and neurosurgery and those things, those specialties, they live in that hospital. They live their life doing that work. And that's fine. Some of those people really love that, that work. They love that job. They are passionate about it. They just don't get a chance to do much else. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So pick it based off of that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, before I close up, does anyone have any questions? Um, you can put in the chat. Or speak. That's okay, too. But if not... Um, I'm gonna take that as a no. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, it's really beneficial, especially since, you know, we're still, we're for first years. We just finished our first year, I guess. We're technically second years now, but we're still <laughs> all trying to figure out what we want to do. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, of course. And feel free to email me if you have any other questions or anything like that. Um, it's been great talking to you guys. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.